I'm not entirely sure. There are some from more like meditative going back, which is actually right after my birth. <laughs> but I, that's not my normal memory. But it is the first memory. And then I have different different memories. One is a bit too embarrassing. I can't share it here. And one is like also the moment where my brother was born. I think at the moment it's to fail, to fail Jen right at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in this life I'm really here with a mission to support um, community-led positive change, people's empowerment, inspire people that this is possible. And my biggest dream is that this um, that this spreads beautifully across the continents. Well, at the time I grew up in South Africa, there was also um, um, the borders to the rest of Southern Africa were closed to white South Africans. You know, mm -hmm. so there was we c there was no free travel. And, you know, what was, I think the things that deeply moved me as a child were nature, the power of nature in South Africa and the beauty mm -hmm. of nature. And being born in the land there, I, I went back just last December um, for the first time, not going to work but actually going to reconnect to the land. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to celebrate and acknowledge just how deeply my home is there. My cellular home is in South Africa, mm -hmm. along the Cape Coast where my grandparents lived. So on the one hand, there's that, that depth of connection to nature, you know, just walking barefoot, um, yeah. being a lot in nature as a child. Um, which I think many people still know today, but less and less children know that are growing up now. Um, and that lay the basis for a natural at-homeness in nature also. And at the same time, my slow and continuous exploration of what was wrong in the society that I lived in and finding out over time that all these small images that I had of, as a child, the things I saw that made me realize that something was deeply flawed in the society that I grew up in. And it was very indoctrinative for us as white children growing up. You know, we were taught history as if history started when Van Riebeek landed in the Cape you know, um, 1652 or whatever. And, you know, the, the, I, I come from the Afrikaners, the Bure, the most conservative part of society. And um, it, was, it was a hard process of finding out what apartheid really meant mm -hmm. um, for me and then starting to truly rebel in my family. And as many of the white families, it also created a terror in the family for me. So it, it, it was a deep process coming out of that. And as I shared briefly before, I went, to, I went on a pilgrimage um, through my country when I was 22, 23. This was 1991. Mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela had just been released. Yeah. Um, the transition process was kind of starting, but the violence was at a high point. And I decided that against everything I was told, which is like, you will be raped, you will be killed if you just walk alone as a young white woman through this country. Mm. I had an inner mission to do this. So I walked up the coast from Stillby to um, Port St. John's in the Trans Sky. 
and just slept on the beach. Mm. I didn't carry much with me. Yeah. I carried less and less with me. And that, were, that journey was a healing journey, you know, because I walked through black townships, white areas. I met, I saw violence. I was nearly raped twice, but both times by white people. Yeah. yeah, so it was, and that was a time of complete change for me. I feel like I gave it my all. I said, okay, I'm willing to die, but I need to do this. I need to reconnect to my country. And what I did before, the social activism and the scientific approach, both actually kept me a bit abstract from the reality. Mm. And the walk that I did reconnected me to the the fabric of nature, the universe. I, I spoke to the ocean. I was given gifts of beautiful shells. I connected to birds and plants, but also the people. Mm -hmm. And it ended in me um, coming home to this community space around Port St. John's, where white and black people were living together. And it was the first place where I... Um, you know, I had a healing experience at a healing well there in the forest where black people, um, African people came for healing. And I had this experience with uh, uh, an African mama putting the mud on my skin and me putting the mud on her skin mm. and us washing each other, which was like a healing, a healing experience. I grew up... Um, in different environments. My grandparents lived in a very small village in the Half Desert, mm -hmm. where I spent time each year, three weeks maybe. Then there, we had a, a house by the beach, in a very old beach place, which was six weeks a year. And those were the free times I had as a child. So those were the most intense times where I roamed nature freely. I was very free. And then the rest of the time we lived around different cities, so suburban life, with both my parents being at the university. Yeah, that was a slow process. It was coming back from this experience in South Africa, and I was already living in, um, in squatted houses, in communities around Amsterdam. I was studying at that time in Amsterdam. And from there I started traveling. When I came back from South Africa, I, I started realizing that there was something happening. Amsterdam in the Netherlands? In the Netherlands. Mm. That's where I studied, yeah. And it, it, both the life in Amsterdam as a student, where I moved into these... Um, I, I became part of a, a performance group called the Mutoid Waste Company. Mm. So I was actually at that time making um, costumes from rubber inner tubes and very, uh, bringing out a very different part of mine. This is when I came back and I, I decided that I wasn't going to follow a scientific career. And I wasn't going to continue being a social activist and I didn't know what I would do. So I became part of this performance group. Um, which later went on to be a part of the Cirque du Soleil, many of them. So it was an interesting, the Cirque du Soleil is today, it's quite an, a, a beautiful and famous circus. Sure. And many of the people from Mutoid Waste, there were some people who crossed over. So it was, it was great performance, city performance. Um, but it was creating landscapes within the city that were completely different from the city environment. So we had a vegetable garden in the squat in the middle of Amsterdam. Mm. I was living with artists, you know, I was already understanding that there were different realities hidden within the mainstream reality, that mainstream reality didn't know about, they didn't report on. Mm. Um, these were hidden realities. And I started traveling these hidden realities. I became more and more interesting, interested. And it was like a mouth to mouth um, secret avenues, yeah? Nothing was secret. It was just hidden. People were um, creating a different reality which was hidden from, which was not visible. It was under the surface of reality. Come in contact with Jen. Yeah. 
Well, it's it. I'm just coming to this, you know, because there's um, the the road most walked and the road less chosen, mm. and it's like I I started walking the roads less chosen, and they led me here, and it even started by you know on this pilgrimage through South Africa, because I started one of my realizations was there's the the main roads that people take on mopeds, on cars, on buses, and then there's hidden footpaths that only the local people take and they are everywhere in the world there's the local footpaths and once you start moving along the local footpaths um, you come to a world which is often unseen you know you you come to people living in places that you don't know you see where the street children live in the cities. You know, you find hidden corners of society. Um, and I started walking those. So I went to visit communities in the Pyrenees, communities all around Europe. I traveled to, at that time, Israel, Palestine. Um, I was with the Rainbow Movement. I came to India. Um, I traveled around the world and I found these communities we didn't call them eco village at the time. This was the 90s for me. You know, I was born in 68, so this was my early 20s, the 90s, when I started exploring this. But many of these places had been emerging since the 60s. Yeah. Some were much older, from an older dream. But I ran into the global eco village network when I came back and I moved through Germany. I met my husband at the time. Um, and. I, I, I became friends, I started living in German communities and I, I was highly pregnant when the founding conference of the Global Eco Village Network took place in Findhorn in 1995. I was pregnant with my son and um, I couldn't travel there but some of my best friends went so I was kind of I was there, I knew it was happening, I was excited mm. about it, but I was a young mother. At that time I was living in a small community called Fasthaus Triesch, it's not known. And later I moved to the eco-village of Siemlinen. And I know many of the big communities in Germany are very good friends of mine. Um, yeah, but that's, okay, that's so change. I met Jen from afar as a mother planting carrots, growing children in a small community. I moved to a bigger community where I started working more and more in the GEN network. So it was a GEN network gathering in a community close by. Mm. I don't know which year that was, maybe 1998 was the mm. first time I went to one of the very small conferences at the time. And then in 2004, I was invited to this um, meeting in Findhorn, which was uh, eco-village educa educators to come together to start writing the curriculum of the Gaia education, eco-village design education, which was born out of the networks of the global eco-village network. Um, so I was involved in the writing of that. From the beginning, from the start of the Global Eco Village Network, traditional villages were always a part of the network. They were always recognized. However, as any eco village, um, traditional villages that wish to transition to becoming an eco village, they're not just recognized as an eco village. There's a, a process, and we say eco village is a process, it's not a particular outcome. So it's also a process for a traditional village to become more and more of an eco-village. We work with the four dimensions of sustainability. Um, the definition that an eco-village is a community, rural or urban, traditional or intentional, that is designed in a participatory way in all four dimensions of sustainability, social, culture, ecology and economy, for a regenerative world, to regenerate their environments. This is the definition. Now, many of the traditional villages are doing better in many aspects of eco-village living than some of the intentional eco-villages 
in the West or in the global South. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of these eco-villages are on the way, including the traditional villages. When we work with um, traditional villages, we um, do woman empowerment work. We, like we, you know, just as an example, one of the networks I was very involved with was a network of traditional villages in um, Oriya, now Oriya here in India, uh, where we ran one of the first eco-village design education courses here in India with women from the Nari Samaj movement that work across all these communities. And it was the women themselves that defined which of the traditional villages would be recognized as eco-village and which not. And at that time, the definition was that because the Land Act had, had led people to um, claim individual plots of land, to take them out of the community context. Mm -hmm. So they decided that the communities that were still sharing seeds, collecting seeds together, sharing grains that had a seed bank and a grain bank, and that were sharing their, that had shared fields that they tilled together, and that rebuilt a shared cattle shed where they would use the cow urine and cow manure for together, um, that these would be the indicators that they would use to say this is an eco village or not an eco village. So it's also like we have indicators from Gen. We have six eco-village principles in each of the dimensions and also the whole systems design area, which lies at the center. Traditional villages on the path can self-assess how well are we doing in all of these areas. Um, so we are currently in a movement in the Global Eco-Village Network. We're coming from a time where we had more intentional eco-villages, possibly, than traditional villages, or more active um, visibility of intentional communities, like Auroville, to me it's an intentional community, than traditional villages, that this is starting to turn around. And we're having more and more traditional villages transitioning to eco-village in the network. So it's, it's very much at the core of our work. We say today, every village needs to become a green village. Every city needs to become a green city. Every village needs to become an eco-village. Yeah, there is not one road map. Mm -hmm. You know, we're speaking about the less traveled paths. So this also means that the way to set up eco-village, there is a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. And it really depends which context people are from, mm -hmm. which context people are in. Um, I would say a first good step is to go and visit the GEN website, ecovillage.org. Mm -hmm. Sign up to the GEN newsletter. Okay. So get plugged into um, inspiration, information about what is happening in a global network. Mm -hmm. You know, to, from the beginning, get plugged in, because that will also mean that you get information about courses that are happening, trainings, you know, through the GEN website, Go to the G Genoa website, the Asian part of the network. Mm -hmm. Link to NextGen, um, the, the youth network, the youth arm of the Global Ecology Network, which has a youth arm in Asia also. Link up to the other young people in the network. So get into this information network exchange. And through that also to receive information about courses, gatherings that are happening. Because it's, it's really important to link up to like-minded people not to try and develop this in isolation. It's a, it's a journey, you know, we're, we're creating, we're changing culture, changing realities, transforming a destructive culture as we, the mainstream is that we live in now, back or forward into a culture of caring, a culture where we, where we really know as human beings that we are here as guardians of life, not destroyers. This means, you know, at the same time, we can't just be idealists and dreamers. If we want to build eco-village, we need to be manifestors. So we need to bring the vision all the way down. We need to walk our talk. And this is not easy stuff, yeah? We will face resistance. We will face moments where we feel we're failing. So we need that network. We need to plug into the network. And that's where I would start. You need information, you need network. Both. The networking, yes. Next step. And then the next step grows out of each person. Mm -hmm. 
or a small group of person. For some people, it might be um, starting a small urban gardening project on their balconies. Yeah, And we, we speak about this model of I, we, world. And this is our guideline. It's like a red thread. It's what is my purpose in life? What am I here for? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm here for to take care of the street orphans. So I might start building a community that brings street orphans home. Maybe I come from a big IT company. I've earned loads of money. Now I feel ready to buy some land in the countryside and create a demonstration site. Yeah, Completely different realities. Yeah, There's not one information I can say, do this, do that, do that. Yeah, But it's like, find out what you're meant to be doing. Follow those steps. Find a first small community. It's important to start with a small group of people. If you want to build a, an eco project, an eco community, an eco village, start with a small central group. Build, clarify your vision in a small group. Look at what is important to you. We often say that it's good to start in a group of seven to ten people, mm -hmm. not more. Because sometimes, like in cities, you can invite and say, I have this dream. You can have a hundred people attending very quickly. Mm -hmm. But then to start clarifying the precision of what you want to do with a hundred people becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be to start with a small group. Clarify the framework, the values, what it is you want to focus on. Start implementing a first, a first um, manifestation of the dream. And this could be like... Here in Auroville, I think one of the first manifestations was to have people from around the world bring soil. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a strange way to start an eco village. Yeah, it's not what we would advise. You know, uh, invite people from 50 countries around the world to bring soil together. You know, it wouldn't be Lovely. as a consultancy, but it's a good way to start Auroville. Yeah, so. It's really from place to place, the start is different. Look at what is the we, and look how you want to serve the world. What is the context around you calling for? Maybe the context, the world around you is offering you to say, here is a piece of discarded land that you have easy access to. Go with that. Maybe there's a different calling you know, around you. So it's a step-by-step -step so, process to follow so your yeah, red thread. On your well, one of the, in the past, I think, in the Eco-Village Network, the land is very expensive. there was very much this, the self-sufficiency is very central. Yeah. Um, the, we call it luxurious simplicity. So living a lifestyle that takes us back to the simplicity of being connected to nature, mm -hmm. but also of being connected to what is good in life. So for instance, as a young mother, there is nothing more luxurious than knowing that the food that I'm feeding my children is coming off the local fields, that I know it's grown organically. That is complete luxury. It's luxury to know that the lifestyle that I'm living is not destroying the future of my children. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's that I know that the compost toilet that I use with my children is being used to plant trees in the forest, yeah? That the water that I use is coming from the well and the water that I have used is returning through a water, a reed bed system, yeah, mm -hmm. in a cycle. These things are luxurious, yeah? But it's also... Um, a luxury to be sharing clothes with my best friends, to have clothes mm. exchanges instead of buying new clothes all the time. So um, luxurious simplicity is a concept that's at the core. And at the same time, coming from the past, we have a tendency in the Ecovillage Network to see money as um, something that we don't want to engage with too much. And to um, this is changing at the moment. So we are saying, actually, there is a lot of money currently floating in the world. A lot of money floating, you know, even the new um, emergence around cryptocurrency, you know, it feels like we're, we're having this new approach of creating money from thin air, you know, and it's not connected to physical reality anymore. Um, and large, I mean, the vast bulk of that money is reinvested in unsustainable development. 
Mm. Um, and we need to channel the money into sustainable development. So we are inviting everyone to, yes, you know, bring your humility, but start believing in yourself. Start believing in the worth of what we are doing. We carry a lot of self-doubt because the past of Jen was to, the past of the Ecovillage Network was to create an alternative, as I said, that was hidden under the surface. We're coming up now, we're showing the solutions we're creating to the world. And with that, there's also a, a learning how to express who we are, how to show, to measure the solutions we create. And from that, so being a new group that is starting, you can use the examples that Jen has created. You can use the brochures, the information. You can use the measurements of eco-village impact, which sh show mm -hmm. that 97% of eco-villages around the world restore the ecosystems that they're a part of, that 100% practice mm -hmm. education for sustainable development, you know, that mm -hmm. we radically reduce waste Mm. We lower ecological footprints. We sequester carbon in these mm. villages. We're doing what governments are trying to do. Bringing this information to potential funders, potential supporters, and the solidity of a good team that knows what it wants to do next makes it easy to also engage people in supporting mm -hmm. you. I think the reconnection to nature is at at the core of what we do and you know from where i sit it feels that the closest piece of nature we have is actually our body the next closest piece of nature that we connect to is what we um what flows into and out of our bodies mm -hmm. so it's the water we drink the food we eat the energy we use all of this is nature um, so, you know, being disconnected from nature means living in a bubble above our heads or in our heads. It's a very sad state, and many of us are in that state. We no longer um, feel our bodies, our emotions. We no longer connect to where does the water that I drink come from? Where does the food that I eat come from? What is this energy that I'm putting into my body? And where does the waste that I produce go to? You know, so this is really at the heart of destruction, I would say. We can start right here. Yeah. But beyond that, there is the beauty, the healing beauty of nature, of all the beings that are right around us, you know. So for me, connecting to nature starts by connecting to the plant on your windowsill, connecting to the bird that is singing somewhere, listening to bird song, opening your senses, hearing, smelling, watching understanding that as human beings we're not isolated in this skin yeah i can feel you from the inside i can feel the plant from the inside i can feel the animal from the inside so yes i do think that it's super important for our school classes to go out go back to eco villages go back to nature have immersive experiences I could share a lot more about immersive nature experiences, but I think it starts right here. Yeah, so Jen is currently really focusing in on economy, the dimension of economy. We have some brilliant examples in our network of eco-villages like Sekhem that have used in Egypt, which have used an economy of love as the base of their work and have really worked with social entrepreneurship from the beginning, mm -hmm. not being afraid to make a profit, but in a way where what they produce, actually the way they, they gain resources heals nature. People working are healed by the way they work and their personal development is taken into account. The product, produce is healing. So it's, uh, but we can produce in that way and still make a profit and then reinvest the profit into the community, the well-being of the community. This is the kind of economy we're looking at. And we are bringing tools out, as Jen at the moment, to inspire um, people around social entrepreneurs 
entrepreneurship, to train people in social entrepreneurship, to link social entrepreneurship to the eco-village principles, to a pathway of change. Mm. Um, and this is, this is very important. It's at the heart. We need to stop seeing eco-village as a weekend activity. We need to earn our living while building eco-village. So firstly, we speak about the four dimensions of social, culture, ecology, economy, and at the center is whole systems. And we changed worldview to culture. Um, at the beginning of Gaia education, we spoke about worldview. Mm -hmm. But we find that culture, it's in people's culture that their connection to the forest is rooted, that their connection to the sacred is placed. So at the center, we have the whole systems design, which br brings together, it's basically the integral approach. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I completely agree with you. And we, we, um, we, where does the political fall in these, in these dimensions? And I think Jen was born from this root of not fighting the existing realities, but creating the new realities from the ground up, from the people. So we, at the, at the heart of what we do is community-led change. We are not the ones to take to the weapons, yeah? Definitely. But c we believe in the right of communities to protect their environments. Yeah. And that's the level on which we work. So we've seen, for instance, after an eco-village design education in Gambia, where the government actually came in, government representatives, to do sand mining of their dunes, which are the only protection against the, the level of sea rise that they're experiencing there. And um, they stood up. They held a demonstration in the village. And the 40 people who got... Um, who got arrested were 40 people who attended the eco-village design education. They were also freed very quickly because they got a lot of global support coming in, you know, people yeah. asking, why are these people arrested? You know, they're protecting their community. We cannot always offer that protection to our communities, but we do our very best, our what about heartfelt best. What about linking with like Green Party? Or we or do not work directly with any political mm -hmm. party. Advocate that. Yeah. yeah, we don't work directly with political parties. We do work with governments and in inspiring governments to take on community-led okay. development work. This is the time where, where as the Eco-Village Network, we need to grow beyond seeing ourselves small. We are slowly coming through the surface. We are starting to be seen more and more by governments, by other organizations. The work we are doing is seen more. We're moving from impact assessment of individual eco-village to a scientific version of impact assessment of eco-village transformation. We're seeing how we can support governments to implement the sustainable development goals and the climate change agreements. And in that framework, we're starting to implement four eco-village programs which is to scale up eco-village transition. We're finding more and more young people that are really um, tired with speaking about solutions, but that want to walk solutions, that want to implement solutions, that are interested in implementing eco-village. So we have the program of eco-village incubation, supporting new eco-villages starting up. We have the program of eco-village development programs, working with governments those governments that are interested in supporting their communities in self-empowered development with yeah. some support from this the government. Like this the is the Eco-Village Development Program. I'll just finish, yeah. yeah. We have the Greening Schools, which takes the schools at, as entrance doors to whole community development. We have the Emergencies, which is rebuilding after disaster but also bringing eco-village design to refugee camps. And we have urban eco-villages, so bringing eco-village design to urban environments. And I think this is the time where we need more people to engage. We are seeing more people standing up as gen ambassadors, gen trainers, gen consultants, to be able to bring this out into the world. Yeah.
as the Global Ecovillage Network, we, um, we grew first Gaia Education, which is a fantastic form of education, um, at the heart of which is the Ecovillage Design Education, co-developed by Gaia Education and Jen. Um, and we run this in close partnership with Gaia Education. Um, at the same time, in Gen, we see that in our communities around the world, also in the traditional villages, long, four-week-long courses are not at the heart of what we do. We work with shorter courses, weekend courses, five-day courses, that are very available to people who are working, to mothers, to farmers, you know. So we have an eco-village design that happens from the eco-village design cards where a community identifies what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are the leverage points. And then they might invite a particular training that supports them to do the next step. And as long as it has certain ingredients, it's linked to the eco-village design principles. It's linked to the, the awareness of this global network that we're a part of of linking solutions back in, of learning from this network. These trainings can be recognized as part of the Gen Education Framework. They can be certified. And the Ecovillage become like the camp campus for the Ecovillage trainings. You can also bring Ecovillage trainings to urban settings, you know, but as much as possible, have it in Ecovillage-like campus settings. And we're creating currently a global learning journey where people can create from this an own career, where being attracted to eco-villages, growing up in eco-villages, starting by becoming an eco-village ambassador, they can slowly become an, a gen trainer and maybe become specialized in one of the dimensions or in whole systems design, they can grow towards becoming consultants. And this is a becoming a career option. So Gen Education sits in that, offering communities the tools they need to, like I was just asked to do consultancy for a starting eco-village. I said, why don't you do this as educational courses? Instead of having me come in as an expert, passing on knowledge, let's come together and look at what are the social tools for the design of the social structures. Um, because it gives all the people involved in this initiative the knowledge and the know-how. So they are empowered to co-design their eco-village. So we use Gen Education as an empowerment tool for the communities, but we also use it as a, as a part of a learning journey where individuals can build a career. We have people now who are second generation, who were born in eco-villages, who are growing through this, yeah? So um, it's, a, it's a special time. We have more and more people coming to eco-villages who've lived in eco-village for a long, long time. Um, so it's, the more experience you have, the better. But you can come to an eco-village lifestyle, practice it, come to some of our training courses, our conference, start grasping what Gen is pretty quickly and combine it with a skill set you already bring. So we have architects, we have engineers, we have social scientists, you know, everything, yeah? Anything people bring, you can bring bring it together with the eco-village knowledge, the eco-village design principles, this way of living, of building solutions, regeneration, and um, grow into becoming an, a gen educator. So could you give me and of course, we're doing the training of trainers, which is a very sp specific entrance story. It's very diverse, so, um, you know, I've been called in in the past year to an eco-village that had a very deep conflict happening to do conflict facilitation and support them in reconnecting to their vision and their dream. Um, we've been invited to support communities to build um, dams, how to design the watershed systems, yeah. 
um, we're invited to support start uh, starting up community with what would be the best way to design ownership in this eco village. You know, we can we have a rich background now from experience, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from the experience. We have experts around the world that we can call on, depending on what people are um, needing. So we usually start with a first and initial assessment where we have an hour long conversation to assess what are really the needs and what would be the best next steps and the best experts to support. Well, the training of trainers gives people, usually people who are already trainers, um, who are doing trainings and other, yeah, in ecology possibly, in social skills, uh, anything, um, to give them the tools to bring in the eco-village aspect, the gen aspect. So it includes a very in-depth um, introduction to what is gen, what is the global eco-village network, but also what is the regional eco-village network that you are a part of. So here it's the Asian eco-village network, Genoa. Um, it includes an introduction, in-depth introduction into the eco-village design principles, the whole map of eco-village design. So also to understand as a trainer that what specifically I would be training, how does it fit into this map of all the different kinds of solutions that are needed to make up a whole system of an eco-village, yeah? To be able to place myself and place my trainings within this whole and refer back to this map. Um, how to use this map for different games, awareness building, um, mapping exercises. They are super useful, yeah? Um, but also we have a whole strand during the training of trainers, which is around community building schools. How do I really offer participatory, experiential, creative pedagogy in the trainings that I do? How do I integrate that? Um, and then there's a whole aspect that is part of the training of trainers of which, what is the audience specifically that I will be addressing in my trainings and how do I um, contextualize the materials for that audience. Lastly, we have quite a piece around what we call leadership presence. How do I, how do I speak in front of groups? How do, I, how do I feel a group? How am I with a group? while I express, um, and also how do I tell my story of why I am doing this work. Our main audience is people who know the Global Eco-Village Network already, who've been part of the network for a few years, who are already doing trainings in their Eco-Village, and would like to bring their trainings home to Gen Education. This is our core audience. However, we also sometimes invite people who are newer to Gen, but who are already working as trainers and bring a high level of skill and enthusiasm. Um, we also at the moment sometimes still invite um, people who are not yet trainers and who are really going, coming to the training of trainers because they want to become Gen ambassadors first. And being a Gen ambassador means that you you earn the right in Gen and you become connected, you become officially recognized as a Gen ambassador from your region, from Gen, and you earn the right to do an official presentation of Gen, so to present Gen and the Eco Village design cards. This year we're having three TOTs, one in Europe, one in Asia, one in Africa. Ideally, I think we'd, we'd love to have one TOT in each of the regions on a yearly basis. I could just say a TOT is a win-win-win. Mm -hmm. Because it helps us to consolidate the way we speak about eco-villages and about Gen. Because we consolidate our um, language our materials so it brings a more cohesive message out while at the same time um, allowing for the cultural diversity in the network to gain its place to gain its voice so also contextualizing the material so it really it really empowers people to speak about solutions you know our main 
aim as Gen is to bring out the news that we can be part of the solutions, we can be guardians of life, and we know the solutions, we know how to implement them. And all of these people coming to the TOT become voices in the world that are bringing out that message with concrete lines into the network, to the eco-villages. So it's, it's a powerful um, tool for transformation. Well, coming back to iWe World, the model of iWe World, you know, community building starts with myself. Many of us don't have a very good relationship with ourselves. We put ourselves down in a multitude of ways. We meet so many young people currently who are secretly and hidden, um, don't have a very high, high sense of who they are. And many are induced into drugs or self-harming because of this. This is quite a broad phenomenon, yeah? So um, community building starts with myself. And we also start with that, you know, bringing awareness around this and start seeing, okay, you know, I think the first shift is I can actually be part of a solution. You know, this is actually about what my heart tells me to do and not what mainstream education has made me into, yeah. I can reconnect to my inner purpose, to my inner impulse. There's a healing that comes from that. Also to realize people around me are also searching. It's not just me that is searching. So it starts from this point where immediately there is an opening of heart. Um, then we start building a safe environment in that community where we bring in concepts like no, um, authentic communication, practicing to actually share what is truly happening for me instead of hiding. And this might be a slow process of, you know, gaining a bit of trust, sharing, and then finding out that actually if we do this in an environment that is held with beauty and care, also with an experience, um, that sharing who I am creates love, not judgment. It's when we hide who we are that we cultivate an atmosphere of judgments about each other. So it's, but so all of that is part of community building. But the other part is just having fun together, doing stuff together, listening deeply. Where do you come from? Like sharing life stories, um, listening to the beauty. You know, every human being is a mystery. We're so deep, we don't know where we start, we don't know where we end, we don't know where we came from, where we leave. We're mysteries, we're secrets, yeah, to unfold. So to see each other like that, see each other afresh, um, and then play games together, um, where we laugh together, we sing together, we plan together, so uh, real ex experiences together, experiencing what we're learning together. And out of that, so we grow community in each of our training courses. That's where community building starts. We have a whole, we have a whole description of games. There is also different collections of games that we link gen educators too. We have beautiful collections of songs that have been gathered in the Ecovillage networks. Yeah, We have some brilliant singers, choir leaders in the networks in different Ecovillages that have collected these songs. And we have a whole toolkit of social skills for Ecovillage building, for community building. So there's a whole array of methods um, that we link people to and that they can tap into. Um, you know, this is more than I can name here now, you know, but starting with like conflict facilitation skills, communication skills, facilitation skills, decision making skills, you know, it goes on and on. So there is a richness there. Toolbox, toolkit. The Ecovillage design cards are a tool that we've been developing in the past three years. And they've grown from the experience of running the Ecovillage design education around the world. So working with, and my personal, I've, I've done a lot of research in the area of collective wisdom. I've written a book in German about the power of collective wisdom researching methods, you know, what leads us as communities not to meet around the lowest common denominator, 
but to go up to the level of collective wisdom. This, uh, this has been very deep research for me. And I've been sometimes in despair about how difficult it can be to bring a group of 40 people together, 50 people, and decide what are our next priorities. But also how difficult it is to invite people coming from the mainstream to understand what whole systems design is. You know, we tend to come from our educational background where either, you know, we're into organic agriculture or renewable energies or green architecture. I'm now speaking about eco-village specialists, you know, conflict facilitation, um, economic design. And every person tends to think that their area is the most important area for survival. It's the first thing that we need to do as an eco-village, yeah? So instead of understanding that we're all part of a map, we tend to come into, is it me or you who is more important? It's a tragedy, yeah? So the Ecovillage design cards were born to diffuse this tragedy and transform it into collective wisdom, yeah? Shorthand. So we use the cards on the one hand to like one design game that we do is to bring people with different cards that they draw randomly three cards from different dimensions together and say, which project would you design together? Yeah, say it's the card for renewable energy, a card for conflict facilitation. I'm just picking three now. And a card for a um, higher purpose, yeah? So they would say, what is the project that we would design together? And maybe they want to bring um, off-the-grid energy solutions to a traditional village. But because of the conflict facilitation card and the higher purpose, they immediately understand, oh, we actually need to have a conversation about local culture, how this might change local culture, how we need to integrate it with local culture. We immediately need to think about what conflicts could the incoming solar panels or whatever we're going to use create in the community? How are we going to use that? So it's tools to under help people understand that whole systems design is crucial for the success of the design of any project in the whole. But also, one of the most, um, we can see how everybody fits in the whole with the talents that they bring to the table. So how everybody holds a piece of the puzzle. And we use it for a crucial design exercise, which is mapping the strengths, weaknesses, and what we call leverage points for a community. And this is just powerful. So within a, a, a session of two to three hours, three hours is perfect, yeah, but I've done it in two hours, going into an African village with two hours of time, with 200 people present, we've played this game, or done this design exercise with the village. So people use markers to put down on the different eco-village principles where they see the main weaknesses and the main strengths of their community. And it's a, an amazing collective mapping exercise. It's very quick. Everybody is involved. It completely um, goes over the possibility that you know of gender inequality in the village. Everybody gets their three markers. They put them down and it becomes visible. And we find that where otherwise people might have strong discussions about what is important, what is not important, because it becomes visible on the map, people don't argue with it. Yeah. And we can find the leverage points, those points that have intense attention from the community at that time. That is, it's not a scientific method, but it's, it's a measurement of where is the energy of the community. <clears throat> so for instance, in that African community, it was absolutely clear that the whole community wanted to focus on a borehole. They needed better access to water. And that was the very first thing, the women, the men, everybody was needing. The second most important thing was better access to education for the children. You know, they were clear and it was clear within an hour what was most important to them, you know. So then you don't need to come as an outside expert and speak for weeks and do a scientific study. The community knows what they need. Um, we also find that it changes every three months. So we can look at what 
or a year, you know, it changes over time. So we can keep looking at what are the leverage points for the community at this point. Mm -hmm. We also, by the way, look at what are the blind points and what are the points where they don't put any markers that might be of great importance. So we can use the cards to have much deeper conversations, to take a conversation much deeper. We do use the cards for a prioritization. So this mapping exercise helps us to prioritize. It's where the energy of the people is. Um, but it's more complex than that. We do believe in leadership in Jen, but we believe that there is more than enough leadership for everyone in an eco-village. And leadership comes together with taking of responsibility. So it's a, a natural leadership which moves over time. Sorry. <coughs> I could say more to this, but I also think maybe we should just stop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Because now I'm starting to cough. Please have something to drink. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's yeah.